tonight we get into the latter part of chapter 9. We're not taking a whole lot of time uh, reviewing last week since now we got a couple weeks back to back together here in Hebrews chapter number 9. And so you remember where, again, we started, uh, Roman number 1, the earthly tabernacle. We saw all the things in there. Number 2, the comparison was to the heavenly tabernacle. And we started out, it's a better place, a better price. And as we looked at it, it's a better price. We talked about animal sacrifices versus Christ sacrifice, all about purification. Then we talked about uh, ceremonial cleansing and conscience cleansing we'll get more into that in chapter 10 there's a, a verse we referenced last week speaks of that so we'll talk more about that in chapter 10 too then we look at an old testament covering versus new testament redemption then last week like i said we're we're going to go quickly here uh, in our review a similar ratification and inauguration but by better means verse number 18 is where we started we understood that word dedicated referencing uh can is a multifaceted word multi-defined word if you might describe it as such it's been ratified the new testament in christ has it's been validated it's been inaugurated dedicated consecrated by the shedding of blood and that really is the key then we took verse number 19 as we're looking here at chapter 9. We took verse number 19. We see the reference to Moses and such. And so what we did it because of that, we looked at Exodus chapter 24, which is a reference that or is the experience or the story that Paul is referencing here in verse number 19. And we said there's several observations. Number one, multiple blood sacrifices were made, both burnt and peace offerings there in Exodus chapter 24. Then we noticed, uh, again, uh, the blood was applied to the altar, the book of law that Moses had written, and then also the people. It was applied literally to the people. They were sprinkled, and they were sprinkled with what we saw, let her see, with the hyssop, and much like a brush that they would use in that terms. And so then letter D, we talked about, uh, the fact that there were similar words spoken in the inauguration of both testaments. I love what Moses said and how it's parallelism, shall we say, to what Christ has said in his uh, instituting or inaugurating the New Testament as we saw in Matthew and Luke and other passages there. Okay? Um, Paul then makes that point. Once there's the shedding of blood, there must be the sprinkling of blood. And this is where we finished up last time. And that last part of verse 22 is very crucial. Speaking out without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. We understand that terminology of remission to be the remission of sins, remission of transgressions. It literally means forgiving deliverance or washing away of sin. That word that's translated here, remission, is also translated an equal number of times almost in the rest of the New Testament as deliverance or forgiveness. And so we understand that that's what that means here. We then compared it back to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. God made an important statement there in Leviticus 17. You remember what he said? It is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. And he's making a crucial point that would come to play in the New Testament much more than in the Old Testament. And so as he referenced that, it's a powerful statement. And we made the, the comment too many churches, and unfortunately too many Christians, are telling sinners to just try harder, be a better person. But there's no way a person can be better until the blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled upon the tabernacle of their flesh through faith in him. And so the reality is, as we finished up last week, here's what we said, if you remember. The only way uh, any of us can do better is by being made better. And how are we made better? Well, the only way to be made better is to be purged, cleansed by our, of our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul is just bringing that to a culmination, and then he'll, he'll launch into how to live once that is the case. Then the verse 23, which we'll start out with tonight, we said the first few words make a great statement, say it best. It was therefore necessary. So if the shedding of blood is necessary for the forgiveness, the remission of sin, therefore Jesus Christ had to die on the cross and shed his blood. Okay, now foundationally, if we were going to talk about a summarization of everything that we have studied in chapter 9 particularly thus far, and then the culmination in the rest of the chapter, we would say this, okay? God ordained that the remission of sins could only be accomplished through the shedding of blood. That's what he's established. That was, that's really what we saw last week. In the buildup in the Old Testament and now the presentation here in the New Testament, that's how God ordained it to be. He said this is the way it's going to be. And as purification comes through the sprinkling of blood, the application, it's necessary for blood to be shed and applied in order for the New Covenant and the New Testament to be in force. 
So it's got to be said, Jesus Christ had to die on the cross of Calvary, and then you and I had to believe in him, therefore making it applicable for you and I, or in force for us. And that's a great statement, okay? And uh, uh, so Paul is really arguing from this old covenant, and then the reality of the better covenant in comparison. Let's look at verse 23. Let's read the rest of it now, shall we? In verse number 23 of chapter number 9. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Okay, another contrast and comparison, and another example of the better covenant and, and why it is. That terminology, did you catch it? The pattern of the heavenly things, okay? The things here on earth, the things of the old covenant, the tabernacle and all the instruments that had to be purified by blood and so forth, and even the priests and such, all of these things are referenced here. And literally, it's reminding us those are just copies. Uh, those are just patterns uh, of the true, the real thing. And uh, they, even as such, had to be purified by the sprinkling of blood. And, and so, in doing the same thing, the better covenant has a better sacrifice. The shed blood and the sprinkling of the new covenant is much greater than that of the old, is literally what Paul is presenting to us. All that blood of the animals shed on the old, old, old covenant was just a copy. It was just a sketch, an outline, a very faint picture of the cleansing blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And it was a very poor picture, shall we say whose blood can, alone can purify the conscience. Now, that really is a tragedy, isn't it? You remember a few weeks ago we talked about how the Israelites and the Jews, modern Jews now, are preparing things for what we read of in the tribulation. In fact, what we read of in the 70th week of Daniel. If you're reading that prophecy, I've been studying it a little bit recently. And as we read of that, we know that the Antichrist is going to come up. There will be sacrifices established as the temple is rebuilt. And we talked a little bit, about, a little bit ago about the red heifer and how the Jews are preparing uh, for that purification of the temple. Now, the tragedy of that is simply this, okay? They are simply pursuing more copies of the real thing. Th those sacrifices, if they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and, and honestly, I'd love to see the rebuilding of the temple, but the temple holds nothing for salvation. It holds nothing for those Jews and their ability to approach God. And that is the tragedy of it. The Jewish nation is making such a push and th such a thrust to build this temple, to get everything in line. They're even trying to check genealogy that they've lost to find priesthood and people who are in the line of the priests. They want to get everything exactly right so in their minds they can get to the point where they can offer a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement and atone for the nation. But friend, they don't need any more copies. They just need the real thing, Jesus Christ. They need the perfect Lamb of God. And so that's the tragedy as you and I read this. It is as if Paul is writing to modern Israelites and modern Jews who are saying, we just need the temple rebuilt. We just need the temple rebuilt. We just need sacrifices to start again for the entirety of the nation. If we can just do that, then God will hear us. No, my friend, repent of your sins. Come to Jesus Christ by faith, and God will hear you. You'll be accepted of him. And that is the tragedy, as Paul presents it here, that the Jews, even in his day, wow, they held on to the Old Covenant. They held on to the old ways, the Old Testament, and would not embrace the real thing of Jesus Christ. See, he's already made the final and complete sacrifice, and Paul is beating the proverbial dead horse. He is telling us time and time again, Jesus Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. His shedding of blood is for the remission of sins. All that is needed is for it to be applied to each individual's account through faith in him alone. Now as we gaze at verses 23, specifically 24 and following, 24 through 28, I'd ask you a question. You see it there on your, your outline. There's an important word that appears three times in verses 24 through 28. You know what it is. There's a hint within the question. Okay, there's a word, an important word. There's obviously probably more than one word that appears three times in verses 24 through 28. Well, okay, play on words, pun intended. It is the word appear, okay? The word that appears, the important word that appears three times is the word appear. One occurrence is in the past tense. 
And so what's most interesting is we come to the end of chapter 29, and certainly Paul didn't put the chapter divisions. We know that. Yet I think they're well-placed for the majority of the time in our King James Bible and such. But reality is this. He didn't put that there, but it is a great little subcontext that he provides in verses 24 through 28. Why? Because he presents to you and makes a nice little clean outline the three appearances of Jesus Christ. The three appearances of Jesus Christ, okay? The first one we'll see is simply this, Christ's current appearance. Christ's current appearance. Let's read verses 24 and 25. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures, there's another term, pattern, copies, picture, shadow, okay? Which are the figures, uh, he says here, of the true, of the real, but into heaven itself. Now to, here's one of those key words, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. Okay, so now we have the comparison of the procedures of the old covenant uh, continuing between the old covenant and the new covenant. Now, here's a reference to the holy place or the holy of holies. You remember us talking about the three parts of the tabernacle and thereafter the temple and such. The holy of holies was the place into which the high priest would enter with uh, the blood sacrifice for himself, for the entire nation on the day of atonement. Okay? Now, did you see the description in these verses? Such a place was not divinely made. Now, we hit upon this at the beginning of chapter 9, too, a little bit. But let's just revisit just for a moment. Those things were not made by divine hands. They were made by human hands. In fact, his terminology here, they were made with hands. Literally, the fact that man made them, okay? And inherently, they are perishable. They are temporary. They will not last. And that brings up a good principle for you and I. We ought to beware of trusting anything with our spiritual life and well-being that is made with human hands. In other words, anything that is of, of a human concoction, anything that is a, of a human uh, uh, putting it together, manufactured by humans and such, we ought to be very careful by putting our faith in that. And so let's give an example. Okay? Certainly there are new doctrines, new religions that are made by mankind. Obviously, we don't want to trust our spiritual uh, livelihood to that. However, there's also churches, quote-unquote, that have been around forever. And what I mean by churches, uh, denominations, however you want to describe them. But do you realize there are many a person in this world that think that they are saved and going to heaven because they're a member of a certain denomination or a certain church, quote-unquote. Just because I attend it and I'm a member of it, they think that that's going to be inherently uh, salvation. In fact, that's where the Catholic Church and, and other, even in the past, they, they held it over people. If you were excommunicated from the church, that was essentially equal to being cast into hell. So you see this idea of a man-made entity, anything that's made by human hands, we ought not to put our faith and trust in it. We'd, much be, we'd be much better off putting our faith in something that God has given us, his word and Jesus Christ, a divine author, a divine architect, a, a divine builder, if we might put it that way. In fact, Hebrews, Paul says that, a, a city that's built by God. That is to which we turn our, our, our faith and upon which we ought to place our faith. Now, what's interesting about it, as he references here, uh, this made with human hands, what is he saying? It will not last. It, it cannot do for you what the divine, real thing can do. Now, just for a moment, consider the fate of the Israels or the Jewish different places of worship. You think of the tabernacle. Tabernacle served for several hundred years, but it was then in turn replaced. David wanted to build a temple, and uh, God would not allow that. So then his son Solomon, as David gathered materials and such, Solomon te Solomon's temple came into existence. And certainly it was a beautiful, glorious temple, and yet Solomon's temple was in turn itself destroyed. Well, the captivity came back, and, and they rebuilt the temple And after the return of the captivity. And, and uh, that, uh, as it was built upon by Herod and others down the road throughout the ages, the day came when the Romans destroyed that temple. And so time and time again, we see this earthly place, this, this place made by human hands, fall apart. It perishes. It, it's proven to be temporary. And boy, if, if you only have your faith in something that is made by human hands, how disappointed you will be. 
Yet the verse here says Christ didn't enter into that. Christ didn't go into an earthly uh, uh, holy of holies where that high priest went. That, that was just a picture, a figure of the true and the real. And so the verse tells us he's entered into the holy of holies of heaven, which is where God is. Now, may I just make a point here? I, I would guess that there's some who've wondered about this as we've studied through Hebrews. And there's, there's quite a difference of opinion about when we read about this. Is there an actual literal temple in heaven? Is there, is there a, a holy place and a holy of holies? Is there a courtyard in, in heaven? And you say, Pastor Henry, well, is there? That's a great question. Honestly, I don't know. But the point of the Holy of Holies and what the temple represents is this. Do not miss it. The Holy of Holies and everything inherent to the temple was a picture, a figure. And the key to that was uh, the fact that you and I don't have to argue about whether there's an exact layout of the temple in heaven. Because the whole point of the temple and the Holy of Holies, it was the means by which people could approach God. By which we could draw near unto God. It, it was the place where they could come in turn and then um, by uh, blood, sacrifice, gain access, could come before God, worship him, and meet with him. So you ask me, uh, Pastor, is there a holy of holies in heaven? And you know what I say? There sure is because the holy of holies is wherever God is. That's the point of the Holy Holies, right? Shekinah glory. God dwelt there between the cherubs, and uh, his presence was, was presented there to the nation of Israel. And that was the whole point of the, the temple and the Holy of Holies. And so uh, the fact is, you and I uh, understand the Holy of Holies is where his presence is. Now, Paul did not miss that truth, because the next thing we see, letter A, or the same thing in the verse we see is this. Christ is now in the heavenly Holy of Holies. And he tells us in verse 24 that Christ is now appearing in the presence of God. The Greek terminology there is literally that he's seen him face to face. He, I, 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 in other words, you and I say, you know, we might not want to text. We might not want to talk on the phone. We want to have a sit-down meeting. We want to have a face-to-face -face meeting, we might say, in our common vernacular. The fact is, that's exactly what the word means. Jesus Christ is in heaven. He's in the throne room of heaven. He is in the Holy of Holies. And there, he has offered, or he's offered the sacrifice. And in many ways, you could say the blood is being sprinkled. It has been presented as the payment for our sin there. See, you remember when the high priest entered in the earthly Holy of Holies. Remember us talking about this? What had to transpire first was that that, uh, that priest had used the coals off the altar. He had to burn incense. And one of the implications of that was that incense would produce a smoke. It, we know the, uh, the Bible would speak of the aroma or the, 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 the smoke of the incense arising to heaven and so forth. The reality is that it would let off quite a bit of smoke. And as he went into the very Holy of Holies, that place would quickly be filled with the smoke of the incense. So that he couldn't see much and literally he was prevented from seeing the presence of God, the face of God. That was the earthly high priest under the old covenant. May I just tell you right now, Jesus Christ is in heaven and he's face to face with God. And the good news about that is, the, to me, the most important words of this verse, the last two. Look at it. The last two ver words of this verse are simply this, for us. Why is he there? Why is it so important, so crucial? Why is it such a powerful statement that he has seen God face to face? Well, it is for us. He is there for us on our behalf. He's applying the blood sacrifice or pleading the blood sacrifice so that you and I spiritually, we are not there physically. You and I have not uh, gone there physically, but we are there spiritually through prayer. And we commune in fellowship with our God. Before where the heavens were as iron as iron could be. And we could not talk to God. The sin has separated us between us and our God. Uh, there's iniquity in our lives and God could not hear us, the Bible says. And so the reality is Jesus Christ is gone and he has pleaded the blood sacrifice. And therefore, literally, he has opened the windows of heaven so that you and I can spiritually come into the very presence of God. If you prayed today, friend, you enjoyed it. You experience the benefits of Christ and his sacrifice, his shedding of blood, and now his appearance in heaven, his current appearance before God Almighty. In fact, the scriptures would speak heavily of this truth. 
As the veil is opened wide, the door to heaven is open. Why? How do we know that? Because that door is who? Jesus Christ. He said it in John chapter 10 and verse number 9. I am the door. By me if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. A beautiful imagery of the reality that you and I now have a direct line to God Almighty. We can enter into his very presence spiritually. And one day, one day, we will be there physically. We'll stand in the very presence of our God. All thanks to Jesus Christ. The comparison doesn't, doesn't stop there because in verses 25 and following, he makes this point, letter B, Christ has now offered the only once and for all complete sacrifice. Here's where it stands alone. Here's where it stands in great contrast to what we see of the Old Testament. The high priest of old had to repeat the sacrifice. He had to go in year after year after year after year. It was never done. In fact, if the old covenant were still in effect, you too, we too would be offering sacrifices on a, year, uh, on a yearly basis, if not weekly basis. We would have to come and offer something. But Christ was the perfect sacrifice and he was offered but once. And within this verse and these verses, he offers a, he gives us another uh, uh, comparison, if you will. He makes the statement about the Old Testament priest here. And if you will, you look at the verse again in verse 25. Not yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest into the holy place every year with the blood of others. That's a great comparison. Because what he says here is the statement you see in our outline. The Old Testament priest offered the blood of others. That was animal blood. It cost him nothing. He did not sacrifice. He did not give of himself. He just did his job. But Jesus Christ has offered the perfect sacrifice himself. It was his blood, his body that he offered upon the cross for you and I. Uh, much greater than the sacrifice of the Old Testament, the ultimate sacrifice to achieve the best and better result for us. Now look at verse 26, if you will. Look at verse 26 in the first part. Verse 26, we'll just read uh, part A, if we might describe it as such. For then must he often have suffered since the, found, since the foundation of the world. Now, read that a second. Think about that for a moment. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now, that is, a, that is a disturbing thought. Paul is trying to argue from some reasoning and logic. Saying, listen, if, if his, his sacrifice was not sufficient once and for all, then Jesus Christ from the foundation of the world would have to be offered again and again and again and again. Literally, his would be a continual death. It would never end. His atoning work would never finish, would never be done. And he would have to suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer since the beginning of the world. And doesn't that sound terrible? From what you and I have already read of the suffering and the, the, the persecution that he endured. And if he had to go through that since the beginning of mankind when man entered into sin. And from that moment forward mankind has not ceased to sin. Jesus Christ will be offered again and again and again and again. But Paul says to you and I, that's not so. In fact, his atoning work, if we could describe it would never be finished. It's a terrible thought. But Paul says it's just not so. Because he offered once and for all. It is a forever sacrifice. It, it can atone like nothing else could ever do or will ever be needed to do. His sacrifice never has to be repeated. It is finished and complete. This is a great picture compared to the Old Testament. Is that a high priest had to do? Is it, you ever get to in your life where something comes up every year and you're like, it's here already? It's already July? It's already Christmas? It's already the beginning, first day of school? It's already, I mean, we can go, boy, the older we get, the more time flies, doesn't it? Okay, so we know what that feels like. Oh, it's already here again. So can you imagine those priests offering a sacrament? Oh, it's already Day of Atonement again already? Never has to be done again. The sacrifice was once in for all. Now look at the rest of verse 26, if you will. We'll see the second appearance of Christ. Notice what it says. But now, 
Once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay, Number one, Christ's current appearance we saw. He's in heaven. He's appearing before God on our behalf. Number two is his consummating appearance. The consummation of all the promises of the Old Testament. The consummation, the fulfillment of what he was promised to do as the, the, the Lamb of God. He appeared in Times past, he went to the cross of Calvary to achieve our salvation and fulfill the payment of our sin. Again, it was once here, put in the age that's the end of the world, that he came. And that's just a good reminder that a thousand, one day is a thousand years with the Lord. A thousand years is one day, right? This is described for us as near the end of the world. Here at the end of the world. The beginning of the end times and some uh, definition of the word. He came to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. And as such, the sacrifice is presented to us. It's a singular sacrifice. It need not be repeated. We've just seen. It is both sufficient and superior in its infinity. In its ability to last. In its uh, uh, enforcement, if we could say. How long it's enforced. And I like the statement here. Did you catch it? Paul did not mistakenly use words or just pick some words did you catch what he said he has appeared at this time in this he has appeared in times past okay to put away sin in other words you see it on our statement here he put away sin he didn't just cover it it's done with he put it away he, he removed it as far as the east is from the west. He buried it in the deepest ocean, as the Bible would say. He has removed that sin. He has put it away. And boy, aren't you thankful for that? He's taken your sin and my sin and he has put it away. He's, he, he, he's done away with it as a, a common terminology we might say. Now immediately that might make some of us think, and perhaps some of you have a background and some other uh, belief systems, whether they be denominations or something else, but there is a modern heretical doctrine that is even today being practiced. And it is the idea that Jesus Christ has to be repeatedly offered. That there is an aspect to the reality of Christ's sacrifice that has to be done again and again and again. Now there are different belief systems and there would certainly be a, uh, several denominations that push this. But the Catholic Church has probably been the primary promoter of this false teaching through their daily and weekly masses. You know, a Catholic, they will often go daily or even weekly to a mass. And, and uh, the reason for that is because they hold to this doctrine. There's a Roman Catholic theologian, uh, theologian, yeah, theologian, his name is Ludwig Ott. He explains this doctrine, and this doctrine is called the perpetual sacrifice doctrine. They try to uh, tie it to the, per, uh, the perpetual uh, high priest position of Jesus Christ. And therefore, because the high priest of old had to offer um, sacrifices continually, they say Jesus Christ has to offer a sacrifice continually. But can I tell you, if you just read Hebrews, you know that's wrong. Not to mention the rest of the books in the New Testament. It makes it very clear and perfectly clear that's not true. Yet they hold to this doctrine, the perpetual sacrifice doctrine. And uh, it was adopted and endorsed by the church in the 16th century at the council, one of the councils of Trent. Here's what Ludwig Ott, this theologian, how he describes it. Don't miss it. Speaking of the mass that Catholics will routinely participate in, he said this. The holy mass is a true and proper sacrifice. In other words, he's saying this is a real sacrifice. When we do this Mass, we are offering Jesus Christ again and again and again. It is physical. It is propitiatory. Removing sins, conferring the grace of repentance. Propitiated by the offering of the sacrifice, God, by granting the grace of the gift and the gift of penance, remits trespasses and sins, however grievous they may be. Now, Frank, can I tell you, understand what he's saying. God's appeasement or satisfaction over your sins depends upon the daily or weekly masses in which that sacrifice is offered. Can I just tell you, based upon Hebrews and the rest of the scripture, that is an erroneous teaching. It is a false doctrine because Jesus Christ died once for all. He came when he died on the cross to put away sins forever. Now certainly you and I ought to repent of them and ask forgiveness for them. But the reality is Jesus Christ has put them away. 
He has paid for them. They are under the blood, as we like to say. The reality is that this teaching is the reason attending Mass is so important to Catholics. You can imagine, if you think my sins are not paid for unless I go to this Mass, you can understand why you'd go to Mass. If you bought into that, if you believe that, Such teaching is obviously directly opposed to what the scriptures teach, as this passage makes it clear. His was a once and forever sacrifice, never to be repeated. It is finished, he said on the cross. And it wasn't just about that event. It wasn't just about that day. It it wasn't just about dying on the cross. It was about what he had atoned for. The atoning work of Jesus Christ. What's the personal implication? Paul loves to make things personal for you and I as believers, and so he does. Look at verse 27. I love it when we get to a context of a very famous verse. A verse you and I would often use, I certainly do, in sharing the gospel and such. But understanding the context is so crucial, right? We come to verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We'll read just the first part of verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Here's what we would call as the personal, practical implication. All men who do not see the rapture will die, right? It's a divine appointment. And you know what I like to say. This is the only appointment you can't sleep through. It's the only appointment you can't miss. You can't forget about it. It is a divine appointment with death, and everyone has the appointment. Unless they're raptured and you're taken in such a way. So we would see the context here and everyone dies once. All men die once. Now, can I just point out something? (laughs) I I don't hear too much of this uh, from maybe people around here per se, but have you ever met somebody who believes in reincarnation? I I have in Virginia when we were out there, we met all types. Okay, we met some. Can, can I just tell you, this verse right here proves that reincarnation is a false idea. All men die how many times? Just once. All men die once. So, if somebody believes in reincarnation around you, don't worry. You're not coming back as a cat or an ant or a mosquito or somebody else, right? Okay, it's not going to happen. Reincarnation is not biblical. It's not right. Right, because why? Because all men die once and after this the judgment and so you know what the statement is here you and i by ourselves and left to ourselves what happens we enter into eternity to face judgment and you and i are empty-handed is literally what paul says here you and i have nothing to offer you and i bring nothing to the table as we stand before god in judgment we can offer nothing to atone for our sins but here's the point jesus christ has already made the payment for our judgment. It is paid in full by Jesus Christ. He was offered to bear our judgment for our sins. If you've ever uh, small been to small claims court or or uh, back in the day, Judge Wapner, okay, or other judges on TV and things, you're that. And somebody ruled, for instance, okay, we rule in the plaintiff in the judgment of, and they'll give them a, a dollar figure. They'll say, okay, for the judgment of, and yeah, the plaintiff owes the uh, the defendant, you know, a hundred dollars or vice versa, defend uh, whatever the case may. In the judgment of, okay. Literally, you and I are going to stand before God, and the judgment is, hey, there needs to be a payment for the sin. And Jesus Christ says, I've already paid it. It's paid in full. It is taken care of. That is why Paul mentions it here. He says, listen, it's a point when a man wants to die. Every man's going to die. And so we got to be ready. Number two, you're, after this, the judgment. You're going to stand before Almighty God, and you're going to have nothing to offer of your own ability. But Jesus Christ, in the beginning of verse 28, says it. Jesus Christ, he bore the sins of many. But I can't help but think of that word many. Can you? See, the reality is, it's Christ's death is sufficient for all. But it is efficient for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know what a shame it's going to be for people to stand before God Almighty after they die in judgment. And they cannot plead the blood of Jesus Christ because they have never put their faith and trust in it. It's there. It could have been paid. It could have been taken care of. It could have been erased. Those sins could have been put away. And yet they have not chosen to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What a shame. What a waste. 
we would pray, may God have mercy. Because we know God is not willing that any should perish. No one should stand before that judgment and not have the blood of Jesus Christ to claim and to plead. Yet there will be some. This is what he did on the cross. He took away the sting of death. He took away the fear of that judgment. And I think that's why Paul mentions it here. He says, listen, we don't have to fear that. It's a point that a man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And, but we don't have to fear that because Jesus Christ, he was once offered to bear the sins of many. He's paid the price. And so we finally come to that third appearance. His current appearance, he's in front of God right now for us, face to face. Uh, there was a time where he came before, that was his consummation or consummating appearance, where he came and died on the cross, he fulfilled everything, he paid the penalty for our sins. And now verse 28, the end of it, speaks of this third appearance, notice it if you will, we're done. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I like to call this one Christ conquering oops that was the next statement let me go out okay christ conquering appearance okay christ conquering appearance his conquering appearance the verse makes it super clear his next appearing will have nothing to do with the payment of sin that is a done deal crucial for the jews to understand even jews today who are trying to rebuild the temple and make new sacrifices it has nothing to do with the payment of sin it is separate from sin it has nothing to do with that. He's already taken care of it. Instead, his second coming, and I would describe it as in two parts, the rapture and the, the second coming where he actually touches down to earth. He will come as a conqueror of sin and death and hell, and now he'll bring with him the fullness of salvation. That's what Paul says in this verse, and it is a beautiful thing. Second time, without sin. Sin's not going to be the topic. Sin's not going to be the focus. Th that is a done deal. It's paid for. He's put away the sins. When he comes again, it is all about salvation. It's all about salvation. What a beautiful truth Paul gives us. He is the conquering king that has come in the fullness of salvation. And we step back a moment. We tie in what we've talked about. You remember we talked about the will, the word testament and the meaning will and the testator and, and all those things that, that we talked about and how he had to die and all the implications here. Well, Paul is literally saying that Jesus Christ is coming back and he will be the executor of his own will. He's going to put it into, into force. He's going to enforce it, shall we say. He's going to make sure that everything happens according to what he has said, his will and such. He will be the executor of his own will. Yeah, I know that's the last blank, but don't tune me out. Okay, I want you to imagine something with me, okay? I want you to think with me for a second. You, you remember the Jews on the Day of Atonement? We've referenced it several times now. That Day of Atonement was when the entire nation would gather together. And we could envision as the tribes were, were, were encamped all around um, the tabernacle in the Old Testament. They would all come out and you could see them pressing against the tabernacle, the outer courtyard, and, and, and some maybe inside the courtyard. And this was a big day. The whole nation showed up for it. In fact, it was required. And the high priest would go into the, uh, the holy and then the holy of holies to offer a thing. Now listen, do not miss this. Think with me for a second what the attitude would have been like throughout the entirety of the nation as they anticipated and waited for the event. The high priest disappeared. He goes in, and they know he takes in the blood, but he, they also know this. If something goes wrong, if he doesn't do something right, if the sacrifice is not accepted by God, you know what's going to happen? He's going to hit the floor dead. They'll stop hearing the, the, uh, the bells on the, the hem of his, his robe. They, they won't hear them ring anymore, and they'll know something is terribly wrong. And so with, with uh, unabashed uh, excitement, Maybe some worry. They all gazed at the tabernacle, waiting. Waiting for the moment that the high priest would exit. Because that would indicate, that would signify the sacrifice had been accepted. Atonement had been made, at least for another year. Now, my friend, can I just tell you right now? You and I are in the very same sense. We are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our high priest. 
And my friend, when he comes back from heaven, the reality is everything's done, everything is paid for. Now we just get to enjoy the salvation he has bought for us. And he's going to take us to heaven with him. My friend, this is a beautiful passage that Paul is pleading with everyone who reads, understand it, trust in Christ. For he alone has shed the blood that can be the remission of your sins. And so you and I today, we look for the glorious appearing of our high priest. And oh, what a day that will be.